this introducing the original blood clad podcast not PS. Sword in semantic. Special dedication all the way from New York. Boom! Yeah man, SWOT semantic. Yeah man. Boom! Sword in semantic. Yeah man. Big ups to the man. Sword in semantic. On another episode of Soothing Semantics, this wonderful Wednesday evening, we have Jonathan Cohen, another man from Brooklyn. I'm sure a lot of you are getting tired of uh, all my New Yorkers on the show. Too bad. Deal with it. it is a lot it is. of us. Yeah, dude. I, I've been mentioning it on my other episodes that a lot of, uh, a lot of people that I've been having are, I would say, easily 50% of my, my guests, I think, are New Yorkers. What are yeah. you gonna do? It is what it is. It is what it is. So, so, John, tell us a little bit about your upbringing. So, for those of you who don't know, there's a community in Brooklyn that was built by the immigrants that come from Syria originally. Mm-hmm. So, this specific community is very affluent, and they're very, very well off. And I was one of the few that was not very well off. I grew up kind of in a pretty regular upbringing, but the kids around me that I went to school with, that I went to high school with, were the kids that they went on vacation four or five times a year. They always had the nice cars. Everything was, you know, they had that rich lifestyle. And so me growing up, not having that, it kind of pushed me to kind of want to do better. It made me become very very competitive and i just wanted to kind of carve a piece out of the of that world Mm -hmm. for myself and that kind of is what i attribute a lot of my what i think is business of being successful Mm -hmm. today is because of that that push is really what kind of brought it out of me so that's a little bit of of where we came from it's interesting that most people don't don't even know that there are Jews from Syria, which is pretty cool. Yeah, anyone from New York knows that they exist, but for a lot of non-Jews, I was talking about this talking about this with uh, Peter, mm-hmm. who I had on, um, and most people just know certain Jewish people. When they think of Jewish people, they just think of like Hasidic Jewish people. Yeah. So yeah, there's a whole community in New York. There's also a community in in uh, New Jersey that ha- <clears> has <throat> has a very large Syrian Jewish population. And, uh, yeah, a lot of them do quite well, seemingly. And, I mean, to be honest, I don't know too much about them. I did work in the in the yeah. community, so I worked in the center. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. That's like I a worked. major... I worked in it, and I rode my bike. <laughs> I was like, what, like 17? Yeah. I didn't have a car, bro. I didn't have a license. I rode my bike to and from, uh, to and from work. But at that point, nobody cared. No one yeah. was like, oh, he has a bike. I don't think anybody cared, because I was a kid at the time anyway. But yeah, man, these kids were getting picked up and who knows what. Like, I was like, holy shit. I, rem- I re- even remember one of the counselors I was working with. He got like a brand new Audi. He was like 17. And I was like, what the hell? That's the norm. It really yeah, is. the norm. Huh? At 16, you had... It's, it's like crazy a car waiting you for you? About like it. a car waiting for you? Yeah, basically. It's, some yeah. of the kids didn't even have their license yet. You know, they just have a car. Oh, here. Here's a brand new BMW. You practice driving. And this is the crazy part is that a lot of them had nicer cars than the teachers in our school, <clears throat> if you wow. really think about it. But hey, I mean, they're very lucky. Not to say that, but you know, but what, though, for I don't, I don't. Part, e- I'm, I'll be honest, bro. I'm not even envious of that. I don't. I'm not giving my kid a BMW when he's 16. You know, oh, I agree with fuck you. Fuck out of here. I agree with you. I don't care how rich I am. I'm not giving my kid a BMW at 16. What the hell did that kid do to deserve a car that some people can never? Like, what did the kid do, honestly? Unless my kid, I mean, listen, if my kid is able to get it on his own, he worked hard for it, go for it. But why in the world does this kid need a luxury car for? For what? I agree with you. I don't know. I don't wholeheartedly. To give him the feeling that he's already rich and successful, it's some, I don't know. I, I, I think if you raise your kids right and you teach them how to, how to value money, you teach them how to make money, he doesn't. He or she does not need to have that kind of car at that age. They they should still. They're still. They're still in many respects mm-hmm. children. They let them do their thing. Like if they want to, if they want to start being entrepreneurial at sixteen, seventeen, good for them. If that's what they want to do. But I don't see the need for that. If they want to do that, they can get their own car. Like if they, you know, that's just me. But I will say though, a lot of them do 
are very entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. They a lot of them kind of have their own business ventures, especially in school. Okay. Like we, used to, I don't know if you had it in your school, but did you guys sell those? You remember those silly bands? I didn't sell silly bands. You know what but I did? You, you know what I, they I, are, I, right? I sold a lot those of those little. Things. So there was one kid who was selling silly bands. Like in in school, he had like the cool ones that like came mm -hmm. in like a sneaker or whatever. He was selling them for five dollars a pop. The kid probably made a couple hundred dollars a day, clean. Really? He was. There was a crazy market for silly bands. A Every couple year, hundred a day. A couple hundred a day, easily. He would. So what he would do is. So 7-Eleven was the only place that had these really, really cool silly bands. And so he would buy them. It was... Yeah, but no one else knew that 7-Eleven had them? They didn't. And that was the whole secret. Or maybe they were just too lazy to go. You know, sometimes... Probably were too lazy to go? Yeah, it was probably... Because they had the money thing. anyway. Yeah. So he would get, I don't know, what, 20 in a pack that cost him $5? The whole pack cost him $5. Mm -hmm. He would sell them for $5 a piece. He would get through two, three bags a day. Mm -hmm. Very easily. Because you know the... The thing that, that really kind of pushed him forward was that it was cool to have more than one. So you'd have, like, kids that had, like, their full arms just covered in silly bands. Right. You that know? was the thing back in the day. Do you remember yeah. homies? Did, the, did you guys homies, have homies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had homies, homies too. Were huge, homies were huge. Homies were huge by us, too. We paid. Yeah. People paid the top. I don't know if you remember. I, I still remember a couple of the specific ones. Sleeper. S Sleeper. That's Sleeper. Exactly the one that was, that was laying down. When I used to get that one, what Yo. was the one with the boombox? The one with the boombox? I don't. I know which one you're talking Bro, about, but I don't when remember. I, when I held it in my hand, I felt important. How stupid is that? It was this little plastic thing. And yeah. when I had one, I looked at that as if I had $1,000 in my hand. Yeah. Like I used to be like, ooh, this is the sleeper. <sighs> Precious. Did you get and in reality, it was a piece of plastic worth a couple of cents at most. And I was like, oh. Because that's what was hey, valued, you know? It's always perceived value. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's so the main thing is is that you remember Sleeper, right? Of course. The so my first, one of my first transactions where I realized, wow, there are some suckers in this world. Mm -hmm. So I got I got Sleeper. Sleeper, what, what did it cost? Maybe 25 cents in the mm -hmm, little. Mm -hmm. I sold it the next day for $75. That's insane. $75 for a little, little thing. That's insane. I couldn't even believe it. And I... And the crazy part is I was thinking about it. I'm like, do I really want to let it go? Well, because it is rare at the end of the day. Yeah, but and, $75. And quite honestly, but you realize that you're talking about kids who are rich. They yeah. just got asked their parents for 75 bucks. Their parents are like, okay. But I thought about it, and that's a crazy for thing. For this kid. Do I want to get rid of it? $75. You, if anything, lost out more than they did, to be honest. Uh, hey. Because for them, $75 is nothing. That sleeper was more valuable. So like, You want to know, actually, the kid who ended up buying from became the best homie player ever. So I don't know if you guys <laughs> played that game where you had to yeah, like, the stand them up flicking and flick them. it. Of course. Yeah. So he became the best one because sleeper was already kind of laying. It was like a cheat code. Yeah. You know, it was laying down so you couldn't, like, knock it over. But he was just killing it. But, hey, I guess he paid $75 to be the best. So okay. he probably thinks he got a good deal. He did. But uh, you think so? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident. I, I definitely, I didn't sell. Okay, so I sold drinks for a little bit. I sold, this was, I sold like 20 of these, which is a pretty good deal. I went to uh, ShopRite and they yeah. had these headphones, over the ear headphones in a package with earbuds, like two in a pack, earbuds and headphones. Bought it for like five bucks, sold it for 20. It wasn't a crazy, I was, I was a kid, I was a teenager, but I, yeah. I sold probably like 20 of them. And people were like, where'd you get, they're like, oh, where are you getting them from? And I'm like, I'm not telling you, you know? And then finally one kid fast. So it was, he saw he, it? yeah, he's like, oh, oh you got man. it in shop, right? I saw it. I was like, okay. So, well, that's business, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. what do you want me to do? Tell you where to get it so I can, you know? The best, the best business that I ever had in school was selling bagels in the morning. Every morning I'd go to Dunkin' Donuts, get maybe 12 bagels. So I think they were, what were they at the time? Maybe $1.50, $4 a pop nice. every day. Really? It's Great. Amazing. It was amazing. That was the best thing. But the thing about it that made it kind of cool in our school is that you weren't allowed to sell anything because they realized that a lot of kids were doing it. So it was actually like a school rule. No like selling in school. You couldn't okay. sell anything. So it kind of, you kind of felt like you were drug dealing. That was the thing. You had a guy kind of giving you the money. Like we did the whole thing with the handshake. You know what I'm talking about? It's so much more exciting though. We did the handshake and they'd be like, yo, come and meet the corn at the cafe. Oh, cream cheese. Bro, vegetable yeah, cream yeah, cheese. Yeah, yeah, You want the everything big with cream cheese? I got you here. And you open your bag, like, you know, hiding. You're like, <laughs> that's how he did it. That was that was the best. So that maybe that's kind of why. You walk in, I could just picture you, bro. Like you you walk in with a bag, like a bag into the into the school and you have like 50 bagels in your bag and you're like, 
Yeah, you yo, David, you felt like you were smuggling it. You really David, were. Yo, bro, come into the fourth fourth uh, grade classroom. Bagels. Yeah. It's usually, are you selling bagels again? No, 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 bro. No, teach. We just, just. That's you know. actually my rabbi's voice. You just did it spot on. I got to tell you, Rabbi Sultan. <laughs> wow. He actually called me one day. It was crazy. He actually called my, he called my parents. And can you imagine like my dad when he answered the call? My dad is like at work and he's like, hey, um, there's a problem at school. He's, he's like, okay, like, what's the problem? Like, he got, he got scared. He's like, your son is selling bagels in school. My dad's like, all right. Bro, and <laughs> like, what's your point? He's like, it's against school policy to, to sell bagels. My, my dad's like, you don't want it to be entrepreneurial. Blah, blah, blah. What, what's, like, what's your deal, man? What are you talking about? He's like, he's making money. It's not his fault. You have suckers in school that are willing to pay $4 a bagel. Right. You should teach those kids, not my son. And then I, I, long story short, I still ended up getting in trouble. But my dad okay. kind of told me. I'm glad me your dad got your back, though. That's yeah. awesome. I would have done the same thing. But, bro, honestly, um, it really is funny whenever I hear these punishments in, in Jewish schools, like yeshivas. They are a joke compared to what happens in public schools. Like, your son's selling bagels. We're, like, whatever bad kids we have in yeshivas, yeah. with the exceptions, like, some kids are actually bad kids. But, like, the bad kids in Jewish private schools are a joke like, in public schools, you have gang members. You have, like, people actually stabbing people on occasion. People are s dealing, like, hard drugs. Okay, and, like, yeshiva, like, some yeshivas, a couple of guys maybe dealing some weed. Mm -hmm. it's, like, a little bit. Like, you know, a guy gets a guy a gram or whatever. You know? But, like, mm -hmm. no crazy shit. Re let's be honest here. Like, we got a couple scandals here and there, but nothing too bro, crazy. nothing major. Like, nothing major. But there was a kid. I'm, I haven't seen this kid in years. Anyway, I'm not going to say his name, even though yeah. it's nothing crazy. But when we were in, uh, I went to Derek Hatora, you know, yeah. that school. So we, we used had, to kick your guys. We used to beat you guys in basketball all the time. Yeah. Okay. So we, well, first of all, bro, we didn't have a big budget. You guys had a lot more money than we did. You probably had much better coaches and what, whatnot. But ultimately. You guys we, had some good players though. Yeah. You were, you were, uh, I wasn't on the team. I, I was pretty I good at ball, but I was pretty good at ball. I'll tell you the truth, man. I really ha was good enough to play ball. I was a hundred percent. I think I was definitely good enough to be on the team i wasn't confident enough that's but really what it comes down to though especially when in basketball. i because i i wasn't there for ninth grade i came uh, in 10th grade and i knew most of the guys already mm -hmm. by the time i got there and i tried out for the team and i just sucked the first night i was there i just missed every shot Bad and i was night. good I'm, I'm good at dribbling i played basketball for years like i'm i'm at this point i haven't played in so long that i don't think i'm very good anymore but i'm sure i still have it yeah, but like you, if you see me play, you'll see that I'm not like I, I have good rhythm. I know how to dribble a ball well. Like I, I shoot well and everything. Um, and if I was more confident and like, okay, I had a bad night, I'm gonna go to the next practice. I'm sure I would have been good and I would have been on scene. But when I was, that's what happens, man. You know, it's, wasn't it wasn't that serious anyways? None of us made it to the NBA, right, dude? But at the end, hey, yeah, we yeah. all had those hoop dreams. It was, it was, yeah, dude. It's not, it wasn't that important. But yeah, whatever. It was just like the you know, the the cool thing at the time. But thankfully, uh, it didn't make much of a difference. But um, it was, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that, though. But, yeah, it's, it's just like going back into this whole, like, school thing. Yeah. Quite honestly, most people listening to the past, whatever it was, 20 minutes of conversation are going to have no idea what we're talking about. Yeah. Whoever did go to private school will, and it'll be funny and whatnot. But, uh, you know, other than the whole growing up thing, you know, you were kind of talking about how you didn't have what some mm -hmm. of the kids had so what kind of ventures have you gone into now that are you know i guess bringing you happiness or bringing you success and what are things that you are looking to do so in the future? i actually run a a company that's it's kind of in the whole cbd hemp space which is actually gaining a lot of ground so what we actually did is we did a little bit of licensing for those of you who don't know licensing it's when we obtain the rights to a brand, a pretty well-established brand. In this case, it was Brookstone. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they give us the rights to their name. I can pretty much put it on whatever I have to. And they just take a cut of my sales. I only know Brookstone as being... There's a hemp Brookstone? Are you not yeah, talking about hemp is my Brookstone. I created that brand. Oh, because I only heard of Brookstone with like the massage chairs. So Brookstone originally was a brand that was kind of... They used to have over a thousand stores. They were very big in the massage chair space, but they were a company that was their kind of their motto was innovation. They used to come out with the innovative because mm. believe it or not, they were one of the first people they created the the massage chair kind of. 
it may not be a brand that's huge it may not be like i don't know what's what's a brand you, gucci mm -hmm. it's still a brand that kind of gives you a little bit of like you know it people know it it gives you some recognition and kind of in the cbd and hemp space there hasn't been one major player yet so because i think that that brand will give me a leg up on the competition and according to the buyers that we've already approached they already liked it and hopefully we're going to roll out soon in a big way so that that's kind of what i've been working on now that's that's kind of my baby that i've been growing up mm -hmm. but over the past you know I, i had my first i started working for my dad at 10 years old my dad did construction we spoke about it so at 10 years old i was already lugging in boilers mm -hmm. and a, for those of you who don't know a boiler can weigh upwards of four or five hundred pounds so imagine a 10 year old helping out to carry I obviously couldn't carry it myself but that kind of showed me what it means to work hard mm -hmm. because you know you've never you never worked till you carried in a boiler and then after that i kind of did a couple of other things i opened my actual first company at 14 machmission incorporated i wish that that makes so much money i just can't cook i don't have that touch damn it i wish my mom would would teach me but you know just, I didn't uh, have that your thought. mom your mom is also Syrian my mom is Syrian my, my father's Israeli born okay. in Israel okay, okay he came here at 20 something but after what's the army. his does he have another he's so I think his father was Turkish I don't really okay. know because well aside from that he died when my father was pretty young so he my father didn't really know him that well either hmm. so it's something that I don't really know but my father is you know a typical israeli he went to mm -hmm. the army much like you did mm -hmm. and then he came here he met my mom and they had me my mom is syrian she was born in syria mm -hmm. it's actually a pretty crazy story of how she came here i don't know if you want to get into that or not but to long story short syria was very oppressive over jews and so jews kind of had to run out and my grandmother when she was leaving they actually opened fire on my mother and my grandmother jumped in front and she took the bullets to save my mother. And to this day, she's actually in a wheelchair with the bullets still lodged in her. Wow, that's insane. And then after that, it gets, wait, it gets even crazier. And then after that, my, so my grandmother was able to leave because she needed medical attention. And she was able to go to Italy, I believe, to get surgery. And then she found her way to Israel and then later on to America. So she was the first to leave. And then my grandfather was getting ready to leave. And while he was on the plane, they stopped the airplane and the guards told him pick two kids to leave behind he had four kids and the people that he chose were my my mother who was the oldest and my aunt who was the youngest so he was able to take two kids with him and two kids were left behind so my mother had to go live by her aunt's house she actually didn't wasn't reunited with her parents until she was 14 years oh, old so he went without the kids huh? exactly he took only two of his kids so he, he didn't have he, a choice why did he decide to do that i'm so not sure if <clears throat> He had to choose, or they made the choice for him. I okay. think that the choice was made for him, but uh, he was he was kind of forced into doing that. So my mother came here. She grew up basically without her parents. Wow. And then when she came here, actually, she came at 14. She went to school here. She ended up graduating valedictorian. She went to college. So she kind of paved the path for me to kind of, which is also something I want to touch on, is that I think that that kind of also gave me a push because i knew that what my, what my family had to go through to come here so i kind of had to be successful mm -hmm. not just for me but for them also does mm -hmm. that make sense mm -hmm. because at least the way that i look at it and a lot of other immigrants kind of have the same kind of mentality is you're not just carrying your dreams you're carrying the dreams of your family with you which is why they always want you to be a doctor or a lawyer or something that that they think is worthy but at the end of the day they just want you to be successful Whatever that may mean to you or to somebody else, because it's success is relative. Mm. But they just want to know that what they went through to get here was worth it at the end of the day. Which is why usually immigrant parents can usually be a little bit more pushy. Because at the end of the day, they're they're relying on you to kind of say, I was right. Right. And so that kind of So I had that fire in me from when I was a young age. I it kind of pushed me to kind of always take a chance on myself, which is why it's kind of a crazy story. But when I was I think I was fifteen or so. So we spoke about how I used to get the iPhone. So bottom line, I used to get iPhones for very, very cheap. Add a thousand dollars to my name, and I said, you know what? I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna buy it. All the money I had in the world, a thousand dollars, a lot of money when I was right, fifteen. Right. You know, it took yeah. me a long time to save that up. So I said, you know what? I'm just gonna buy it. I'm gonna do it. I don't know who I'm gonna sell it to. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. 
I'm just going to do it. I trust myself. Worst case, I lose $1,000. I made it once. I can do it again. Mm -hmm. So I bought, it was three phones. They were around $300 or so each. I sold each one for $600. So I doubled my money. I did that again a couple times. Then eventually I built up enough capital. I was making a lot of money. So by 16, I was making a very solid amount of money for someone my age. And then I was obviously a little a little kind of uh, stupid with my money. I bought a, I had a Mercedes that I got paid for by me just because just because I could. You know, I had a nice Mercedes coupe. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of delved off into other ventures and eventually it brought me to where we are today with with the CBD hemp company. So we all kind of just branched out and kind of went into, th into different avenues that kind of mm -hmm. brought us to this ending. Dope, dude. I was a waiter for years. That's what I did for a long time. I did that too when my father had a restaurant. Yeah. Wait, being being a waiter was definitely good though. It taught me a lot for sure. It taught me like it's it's okay to do the shitty work. Absolutely. You know, meaning you can work in a very upscale place. I just worked in these small like events. I've done mm -hmm. like bigger like hotel jobs and carried tons of dishes and slaved away. But it really just taught you to, you know, to do the things that aren't. Uh, exactly so appealing to to just anyone so um it wasn't the end of the world made, made pretty mm -hmm. good money doing it but it uh, wasn't anything substantial but it's i'm glad I, I did that kind of work for sure and i, I always appreciate waiters now you know i, just, I definitely do also just because i remember what it was like yeah. <laughs> but i'm nice to them man like yeah m there's a very rare very rare where i'll i'll never be rude to a waiter ever but like, you know, if they miss my order, I'll say like, you know, hey, whatever, but I'm never nasty to them. I can't be because I knew what it, know what it's like, you know? Absolutely. Um, so. But yeah, to I touch see. on your point, there's no embarrassment of doing hard work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. And it's something that everybody should learn. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as you put your head down and you work, eventually it'll come. Yeah. We were having this conversation before. And it's the same thing. If you put your head down and you work, eventually it'll come. I mean, how long it'll take is relative. Well, it also depends what you're doing. I mean, you have to be uh, practical because you can do many things and work your ass off and they'll bring no results. You, see, you like have what? to, well, quite frankly, if you're a janitor for 40 years, nothing, nothing really will change. I guess that's true too. It does depend on what avenue you take. Technically, you can work in a very upscale building as a janitor, and maybe somebody will see you and end up hiring you, and you may switch. Anything's possible. Yeah. But that career path alone not won't really take you anywhere. And the reason for that, mm -hmm. largely, and this is something that may be redundant to a lot of people, is that you simply get paid for how valuable you are. So if you're easily replaceable, you aren't really bringing much value to the table because mm -hmm. realistically, anybody can be a janitor. It's not. This isn't. Uh, now, there may be janitors listening to this, and they may be offended. Well, I wish you well. I think, uh, you know, there's no judgment as far as you as a human being. I have complete respect for you. Job is a job. At least it's better than not having one for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, it won't bring any, not only will it not bring wealth, it won't bring, I mean, this is all obvious. <laughs> no one needs me to say this, but uh, it, the world's a dog-eat-dog -dog place. So for me to say that, hey, go and do that and enjoy, I, I can. But you can't really feed a family on that. Absolutely. It's not really doable. And, and I think anyone should strive to do something where you, you're you very valuable. Now, we all need someone to clean. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important. So this is what I'm saying is, is very controversial because obviously someone has to do it. We need people to, to do that kind of work. And for people who would prefer not to work unbelievably hard for them it's just work that makes sense to them they know the, they know the job they know what it, it entails they live a very simple lifestyle for some people it works for them you know i mean very different from how i think but ultimately i mean we you can't have any kind of establishment without it being clean so mm -hmm. you know especially with covid i i appreciate people who do it um quite frankly i don't know how they do it i don't um, right here publicly saying this on my podcast, I don't know how people do it for a living. Very hard for me to understand. But in, in a way, I respect it for sure because it's it's something that, uh, yeah, something I can't say I would do, to be honest. 
So I agree in in a sense, but I mean, my so my business partners told me something very early on, yeah. and it's something that kind of stayed with me. They said not everybody can be a boss, right? So it doesn't mean that not everybody has it in them. Maybe you not do. everybody has it in them, man. Really? I don't know. I don't. I don't know if I agree with that. You think it's one of those things that you're just born with? I'll tell you whether what it you is, have man. it or I you don't. I think I think everybody has the potential. Exactly. But some people have it a lot more. It comes in more naturally to them. So several factors. Here and here's the fucking reality. Mm-hmm. When you are good looking, you have more options. I'm not sitting here saying I'm some crazy model because I really don't think I am. I'm definitely very confident with. I feel good. I feel like I'm a good looking person. But there are definitely better looking men out there. Just being yeah. honest with how I think. But uh, I think it looks definitely benefit but it's not the be all end all at all okay that only gets you so far um hold on i was definitely gonna i I was touching up on a point so i'll ask i'll just touch base on what you said though do you think being good looking gives you the confidence no no, so let me finish let me because i I got my my thought back Mm -hmm. when you're already good looking you have an edge now what you do with that that kind of head start is everything so there are plenty of people who are extremely extremely good looking but other than their looks don't really bring much value to the table okay now this is a very blunt statement but it's true there's some people that just get by on looks alone and they don't really have anything else of value to bring to the table so you know they just they don't do that much else okay um now now then at the end of the day so if you have that and on top of that you work constantly work on your weaknesses now this kind of ties into a whole other conversation because I think it's important not to focus on 50 different things at once. It's important to focus on your strengths and delegate weaknesses. But at the same time, if you know that the only way to get where you need to be is to focus on certain weaknesses, meaning in mm-hmm. order to be a leader, there are certain traits that you need to work on. Okay. And you can't delegate those traits. You need to have those traits. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, eventually, once you're old enough, you can have your son continue the company or you can hire somebody that has been working under you for many many years and he can take over or she can take over Um, but ultimately in order for anyone to be a leader some people have it from their parents you know some if your dad is a ceo of a massive corporation he's probably going to pass down that same energy and that same charisma to his children Mm -hmm. you may not may it not necessarily will all his children have those traits because you know, people are people. So you can have this loud, energetic guy who has a son or daughter that's very, very quiet. And same with a, same with a, you know, a woman yeah. who can be a CEO. You know, uh, but generally, a lot of it is nature and nurture. So if you don't have that, because you know, me growing up, I didn't have any anyone in my family who owned any companies. It's something that you have to develop. And I, but I do think it comes easier to certain people than other people. And I do think that for some people, it's extremely hard. Some people, they don't have it in them. Because to, to, for them to get there, they have to, they have to fight so many battles. It's, it's near impossible. Is it doable? Sure. Absolutely. But I don't think a lot of them are willing to go through that. Because it's like some people are, are unbelievably shy. They're painfully shy. Mm-hmm. Forget about owning a business. They don't want to talk to people. They have crazy social anxiety. So before they open a business and, and lead a team of people, they're scared to even talk to another human being, okay? Yeah. So that is a massive hurdle to get over. So, and then there are other people who just, as soon as they open the door in the morning, they are they ready to go, you know? And they're just, they, they don't have to work on it. It's there. So, yeah, life is unfair that way, man. It's not... Uh, life is definitely unfair. But that's what but, makes it awesome, to be honest with you. Yeah, because not everybody can be equal. Right. No, well, that's also well. We should it. be equal in some aspects, but I mean, there always has to be a bit of competition. That's what I'm saying, though. It, the beauty of life is that it's not equal, and if you want the, the, you want the 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 sweetest of fruits, then you have to, you know, beat everybody one. else. You're in a sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's really what it's about. Hmm. But yeah, I mean, I agree, but I think I I believe wholeheartedly that if somebody wants something enough you can do it. I think if you were the mo- the shyest person ever, because I was pretty shy when I was younger, and then I just kind of was thrust into a role where I had to kind of be a leader, I guess. Mm. And then it kind of grew on me. It definitely didn't come as easy to me as it did to other people. 
I guess. But once you, because I wanted it, you know, mm-hmm. I, I wanted, I knew what I wanted to be very early on. I knew I wanted to be successful. I wanted to own a successful company. I wanted to have a team. I wanted to kind of, I wanted to be a boss. That's, mm-hmm. that's what I wanted to do. And so maybe I wasn't so cut out for it in the beginning, but because I had that vision in my head, I was able to just kind of like kind of what you said, work on my weaknesses, which in my case was being shy, I guess, but I always was a little on the aggressive side. Mm -hmm. So I always was, I always had the confidence to kind of go and do things, but I guess I kind of brought it up to a level where I wasn't as shy anymore. Now I wouldn't consider myself a shy person Mm -hmm. and that's definitely helped. But I think that it was something that, that had to be worked on. And I think anybody given whatever circumstance can work, and make something of themselves as long as they want to Mm -hmm. especially today a lot of people kind of feel like i didn't have the opportunity that this person had i don't have the upbringing that this person had it's so hard for me so it's not even worth it for me to try Mm -hmm. a lot of people just kind of want it given to them and that's just not how the world works but if you want to kind of make something of yourself you can do it me and you are prime examples Mm -hmm. we both I would say didn't grow up with much. We didn't have anything given to us growing up. And I would consider me and you would be somewhat successful. Wouldn't you think, wouldn't you agree? So it kind of comes down to if you're willing to work hard, because you know, even, even what you said, you can't be the most good looking person. You Mm -hmm. can't be the smartest, but you can, you can outwork anybody. If you really put your mind to it, you can't expect necessarily to be, realistically i'm probably never going to be as wealthy as elon musk not because i'm not confident not because it's not possible Mm -hmm. quite honestly i don't it's not a goal of mine i don't need to have that much money Mm -hmm. realistically it's i don't even think his goal is to have that much money it was a product of how innovative he is Mm -hmm. i don't think he's like oh i need to have almost 200 billion dollars it's not his it wasn't his goal i doubt it I don't think I'm as brilliant as he is. I don't think I am well aware. <laughs> not even going to try to uh, think I am. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, I have my own things to bring to the table. I don't, I'm not going to build a spaceship. I don't have, my brain does not process information that way. It does not, it doesn't have that level of capacity. Like, it's just not like that. He's a savant, man. He's, yeah. he's something else. But it's different. You know, he's peculiar. He's a, he's, he's a socially quirky dude. I think I'm a lot more in my own way down to earth than he is. So would I want to be him? Absolutely not. Would I like to have a nice amount of his money? Yeah, that'd be great. Would I like to, am I, am I extremely impressed by him? Oh, a hundred percent. I'm extremely impressed by who, what he's accomplished. But then again, listen, it's, we all have our own, our own goals. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, that's not a path that, you know, you get what I'm saying? Some people would love to be somebody else in a heartbeat. Perfectly happy with me. I just have to build my own, yeah. my own uh you know skyscraper if you will um you know and he has his and my goal is to build mine and whatever that is will be yeah i agree so, i mean know. it's based on what you want at the end of the day you have so, to work towards your own goals but you have to be willing to put in the work to get to those goals sure there are people that do say i want to be elon musk i want to have the same amount of money that elon musk has okay what are you willing to do mm-hmm. to get to that goal and that's, that's kind of what differentiates people. That's what it is. You don't have to be Elon Musk. You don't have to be as smart as him. You don't have to be as successful or be as innovative, but you can be the best you and you can accomplish your own goals. And sure. that's, that's kind of what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I get that. I, get not, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people who, who say, hey, I want Elon Musk's life. But I don't know if anybody really would want his life. I mean, did you ever read the stories on this dude? The guy doesn't sleep, man. Yeah, he's, he doesn't he's, sleep. He runs five companies. I'm sure he's a lot more stressed out than, than most people think. That's what he wants, though. That's, at least that's what he's, that, uh, he's living his own exactly, dream. Exactly, exactly. But that's, that's my it. whole point is that he's living his dream. Right. You don't, why would you want his dream? I wouldn't. Exactly. There are people who would. That's, the, well, that's, the, that's it. The that's only exactly reason, it. I said this in another episode, the only reason you, people want to be someone else is because they're not following their purpose in life. That's it. Yeah. Simple as that. It's very important yeah. to have a goal in your life. Yeah. It's, it's it really it. is. Mm-hmm. Because that's kind of what... Yeah, it's a drive. I mean, you. purpose in life is... I guess that's relative also depending on if you're spiritual or whatever. But 
a goal in life is something that you can always work towards. Right. And it's something that kind of evolves with you. Right. Because once you get finished with one goal, there's another one and then another one. And then hopefully, you know, I mean, I think at the end of the day, everybody's goal is to just kind of be happy, whether whatever that means to you. But that's still a goal. You know, if your goal is to be happy and you work towards it and you do something that makes you happy, it's the same thing. So it would a massive goal for me right now in the next couple of years and a simple level is just to be able to give to my family mm -hmm. in a way where, and it's as simple as this. I want to be accomplished in the things that I set out to accomplish to, to a large degree. Obviously I'm going to have many accomplishments throughout my marriage and throughout my mm -hmm. life, but to a foundational level to, to accomplish the things that I've set out to in, in the sense that I don't have to work for money. Money works for me and where I don't have to ever worry that my wife and kids aren't provided for that. They're, they're covered and they're happy and they look at me as, as you know, the provider. And I'm old school like that. Everybody's different. People yeah. well, why can't the woman be the provider? She can be. But I want to be the provider in my marriage. So say what you want. That's how I like it. Um, when I say provider, I mean financial provider. I don't mean sole provider. Everyone mm -hmm. like goes, well, what does that mean? My, my wife and I will be just as even, just as equal. We just have different roles. That's, that's how I see it. We can play both roles. We can do both things. You know, this, that. I'm not going to sit here and excuse myself and whatever. But ultimately that's the thing so yeah that's that's just what i want i want to be i want to be looked at as somebody that that can that's taking care of the taking care of the house and doing what's got to be done you absolutely. know absolutely it's a very noble and, goal and exactly and uh, i just uh to not be able to do that's a very very it's a shitty feeling to be honest with you i don't want to be one of those people so god that's, willing man yeah. that's understandable i mean it comes down to it anyways if you're willing to just do the work, you'll get there. But yeah. I'm also kind of old school in the same mentality. I also want to kind of have money working for me yeah. where I don't have to worry about money anymore. Right, right. Be it, but at the end of the day, you don't I want still, the, You don't want them to call you on the loudspeaker anymore. I definitely don't. Want you to so we actually didn't speaker. touch on that, did we? So by the way, so for those of you who don't know, in this private school that I went to with all the kids that were well, very be honest, well Jonathan, off, nobody knows. Yeah. Unless, me, unless there may be a couple of yeah well in this this high school that i went to mm -hmm. so if you were not up to date on the tuition they would call you on the loudspeaker and tell you to come downstairs they didn't specifically say hey calm down because you didn't pay the tuition but everybody kind of knew mm -hmm. so i was always on that list of kids that were called down and so i that kind of sparked the whole competitive fire where i actually made a promise to myself kind of what you just said that you wanted to do as well. I would never want my kids to go through that because I remember how bad that felt. It was definitely not a good feeling, but I mean, I kind of took it in a good way. I guess you could say I used it kind of as fuel to kind of get to my goals and get to where I want to go as opposed to kind of holding it in as anger, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And so that kind of pushed everything forward. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a little old school like you. I want to be the sole provider. And and at the end of the day, even if I had a billion dollars, I I don't know if you'll agree with me or not, I would still get up and work the next day because it's just, I enjoy business just in general. Right, same here. I just enjoy the day-to-day. -day. I, like, I like the negotiations. I actually love to negotiate. One of my favorite things ever. Yeah. I love to negotiate. And at the end of the day, I kind of look at business and life kind of, just as a game, kind of like how we played ball in the park. Whoever has the most points is the winner. So money is kind of like, you know, at some point it just becomes relative. Mm -hmm. You you have a million dollars, a hundred million dollars. Like it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But you just kind of use it to keep score. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. For That's sure. kind of how I look at it. I just want to, I want to be the winner, I guess. Will I be the winner? Maybe not. Maybe I won't be the world's richest man, but hey, maybe I could be. Why couldn't I be? And that's kind of, it's kind of a goal that I kind of have my eyes on. But obviously, there's there's a lot to kind of get me there. But it's you know it's a work in progress, just like everybody else. We're all kind of working towards our goals as best as we can. Dude, I completely understand that. I completely agree with you. Just like Jeff Bezos, man. Well, actually, he that's, he did crazy. just retire, but he he stepped down as CEO from Amazon, which actually shocked me. But 
I always wondered, like, why does he, you know, he's he was the world's richest man. I don't know if he kind of overtook that or not. They're they're kind of battling. They're, yeah, they are. Battling. I think Elon's gonna take him though because Elon's still like, yeah, you know, going full force. But I always wondered, like, why does he wake up in the morning? Think about it. Why he doesn't he doesn't have to his his great 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 grandchildren are already taken care of. It's so, crazy, like, you know. I'm sure one of his main dude. His family's taken care of for tens of generations, like for exactly for, for ten generations. So, I mean, he. What reason does he have? Ten to get generations, up and go to work? twenty generations. Yeah. So insane. I, he, he gets up to probably, at least in my opinion, I think he gets up to kind of get his score higher. I don't even, th- dude. You know what though? That's that's really what it. Once you have a certain amount of money, mm-hmm. it just becomes purpose, like. Exactly. We all need to have enough, and enough is relative, but once you have billions, man, you don't need, more. like, first of all, you don't need billions to begin with, okay? Okay. But once you are already a billionaire, unless you're an idiot and you somehow manage to spend all of it, because you can do that, it's possible, if you buy enough massive houses, I think uh, you can Nicholas do Cage it. I think Nicholas Cage kind of did that. Well, then, well, I don't think he was a billionaire, and he's definitely not a he billionaire. He spent... I think close to five hundred million dollars. He oh. bought like a dinosaur skull okay, and, well and then, castles. I don't know what to tell you about that guy, but ultimately, most—not uh, most people. Most people do blow a lot of their money, but if you are somewhat intelligent and don't throw all your money in the garbage, and you have a billion dollars, mm-hmm. you can easily live off the rest of your life easily without doing anything. One hundred percent. Okay, anything. You don't have to lift a finger for the rest of your life. Okay, mm-hmm. even if you're ten years old. If I, if you were ten years old with a billion dollars, you can live the rest, and it, that would maybe a no, that's no, a billion dollars we're talking about. You <laughs> could go. Okay? You can live the rest of your life from ten years old until you're ninety-seven on one billion dollars and manage that without doing an ounce of work at all. A billion dollars is a fuck ton of money. Most Absolutely. people, they see a billion. What do they do? They buy a hundred million dollar house. They buy ten cars. They they go shopping every day. They buy this. They buy that. They buy five of their friends a house. Blah 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 blah. blah. Yeah, if you want to spend it, you can spend it. But like, we're talking practicality. You, yeah. That's so. I think for, at the, my point is that uh, purpose is what drives you. You can have as much money as you want. Some people will retire. Some people will. Some people you give them three million dollars. At thirty years old, they'll stop working. That's not enough to hold you off until you're till you're dead. But some people, that's it. some people don't want to work, man. Some people hate work. Some people hate doing anything other than just sitting and watching TV or chilling on the beach. And that's why nowadays it's very nice because some people have Instagram and they literally just make money on Instagram. They, I, I think that's crazy, crazy man. Nuts, what a world man. we live in, especially like the the tech talkers. Yo, these dudes. Crazy, right? Um, I can't remember her name. The most famous one. I don't know. I don't know who she is. Whatever. I I remember she's fifteen. Mm-hmm. She's making like six million dollars a year. No posting way. 30 second videos of her like you know doing the renegade and all that it's, it's crazy six million dollars man and let's not even talk about only fans that's like that's <laughs> completely different yeah but john you've only had it for two years dude so and only fans has it how much has it been making you not that much man <laughs> i don't know I, i'm not one nobody, of those good looking nobody dudes. wants to see your hairy syrian feet bro i know <laughs> but hey some people do we got some customers there. Yeah, okay we're right, good but yeah, it's it's definitely that's I think that's the craziest thing. There's I heard a I saw a documentary on it. There's a a woman that she makes close to 300 grand a month. It's it's actually a pretty interesting business that they got going on. They charge for um for messages or something also. So if you were to text them it's like $5 a text. Just think about that. Imagine you got paid $5 per text throughout your day. It's insane. It's a crazy world. But listen, kudos. Let them do what they want. Absolutely. It's not a business I, for me. Yeah, but. it's not. didn't give me satisfaction. If it makes you happy, go do it. Do, go do your thing. Definitely is a bit, it's a bit nerve wracking. Nah, it's not. I don't care. Well, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm saying that, so maybe I do partially, but it is like when some people really have to, you put in hard work and then you have people like that literally just showing off their body and making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. It's kind of like, it just, it just cheapens what hard work is to me. But then you'll have them who will be like, that is hard work. Do you have any idea how hard I work to put myself together? It's like, okay, we'll agree to disagree. Doggy dog world. Well, yeah. Listen, man, if it sells, it works. And this exactly. And so at the end of the day, I don't, I don't, 
what can i say right you don't envy them you wouldn't want that life anyways no that's true exactly so it is, so it is what it is yeah i wouldn't I, want I, it either i agree with you john pleasure thank you for coming my dude always man i appreciate you bro it was a pleasure like ladies and gentlemen this has been another episode of soothing semantics tune in every second day of the week well technically first day of the week i don't know i've just mentally i've always thought sunday was the first day of the week uh tune in every monday for new episodes until next time